Here's what's coming up in episode 56 of the Big Seance podcast. The truth comes out in my interview with SPR researcher and author and the man most responsible for probably everything you know about the Enfield poltergeist, Guy Lion Playfair. They just turned up one day, and I, I left as soon as I could because I just didn't like them. Yeah. I thought Ed Warren was a complete BS specialist. Uh, Lorraine was fairly harmless, but I didn't speak to her, so I can't comment. But I, um, all I remember was Ed Warren telling me that either he or I could make a lot of money out of the case, and I pointed out that that's not why we were there. So, so let's spend a bit of time on the BBC miniseries, The Enfield Hunting. Nothing, none of the incidents shown actually happened, except the first one. Mm. Which I forget what it was, but all the others were completely invented, and uh, I certainly never levitated to the ceiling. But more seriously, they left out all the really good ones that did happen. Certainly, the, the suggestion that I went there to keep an eye on Morris Gross was absolute rubbish. I mean, we were totally... Uh, cooperative with each other right from the start. He never had the slightest difference of opinion. And he says in one of his articles, I never said it was possible, I'm saying it's true. <laughs> and I've taken that as a kind of motto ever since. I mean, I, I don't claim the poltergeist are pretty impossible, but they are true. I, I've certainly seen quite enough of them, and as far as I'm concerned, they're as real as anything else. Well, I started out as a, as a journalist, and then, you know, when you... Uh, working for a newspaper, you, you go to the scene and just, just describe what you see. I mean, you don't have any sort of particular moral judgments about whose fault it was that there was a car crash or whatever. You just describe who did what and when. And I, I took the same, exactly the same attitude to um, investigating poltergeists as, as, as I would with a hydroelectric dam or, or, or um, plane crash or whatever. I mean, it, it's, it's just... Uh, developing the skill to, to describe clearly what you, what you saw. I'm very curious to know if you feel like you've had any spirit contact from Morris since his death in 2006. Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance. You know how sometimes you get sucked into a rabbit hole when you're online? This is often the case for me when I find a random YouTube video that I find interesting. And sometimes even when I don't find it interesting. Let's say, just as an example, that it's about frogs. This frog video then somehow links me to another video. Then another. Then another. Until suddenly... I realized that I've been watching video about Esther Williams for four hours, and the sun is coming up. Yeah, I know. Stop laughing. The last couple of episodes of the Big Seance podcast have kind of been like that. It's truly been awesome, though, if you've been following it. I've just been following the rabbit hole. Surely you've noticed. Well, I think I've tunneled through this one long enough to strike gold or carrots, or whatever you find at the end of a rabbit hole. But this has been another one of those Elvis moments, I suppose. I consider myself very lucky to be able to share a conversation I had with the Guy Lion Playfair, the author of This House is Haunted, which documents the famous Enfield poltergeist, events which took place in the late 1970s in England. It's also the focus of the upcoming The Conjuring 2 film. But here's the kicker. The movie supposedly doesn't have anything to do with the research of Mr. Playfair or Morris Gross, his partner during the investigation that lasted for over a year. Instead, as you probably know, it follows the supposed investigation of Ed and Lorraine Warren, 
Well, since it was announced that Enfield would be the focus of the Conjuring sequel a few years back, many have questioned whether the Warrens were even involved in the Enfield case at all. Well, I think I mentioned in the last episode that Dr. Tom Ruffles of the SPR contacted me. SPR is the Society for Psychical Research, by the way. Well, looking back through my Twitter, I realize now that Monkman72 is actually the one who linked me up with Dr. Ruffles and his great article that answered many of our questions. So thank you, Monkman72 on Twitter. And so to complete this rabbit hole, it's Dr. Ruffles that connected me with today's guest. And I think you're going to be very interested in what he has to say. Get that tea ready quickly, because I now take you directly to my phone conversation with Guy Lion Playfair. Hello. Is this Mr. Playfair? Yep. Hello. Is did I catch you at the appropriate time? Yes, you got it absolutely right. Yes. It's okay, well off. good. It is such an honor to I, I mean I'm very anxious to speak with you. It's this is so cool and I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity. Mr. Playfair, I've read your book, This House is Haunted, and I recently read the one chapter of Gerald Brittle's book that involves the Warrens and their experience experiences with the Hodgson family at Enfield. I've also recently seen the BBC miniseries titled The Enfield Haunting, which I loved, by the way. And I've also had Tom Ruffles reach out to me with his great article regarding all of those sources I just mentioned. So my audience has been following along on this journey of me asking questions and looking for answers on if and how Ed and Lorraine Warren in, uh, was involved in the case, what the new Conjuring 2 movie is about. And I just thought, who would be better to talk to than the man who experienced and documented all of this so beautifully for over a year. Can you briefly tell us just how and when the Warrens were involved at Enfield? Um, no, I'm afraid I can't, because um, as I remember from nearly 40 years on, they just turned up one day and I, I left as soon as I could because I just didn't like them. Yeah. I thought Ed Warren was a complete BS specialist. And... Um, uh, Lorraine was fairly harmless, but I didn't speak to her, so I can't comment. But I, um, all I remember was Ed Warren telling me that either he or I could make a lot of money out of the case, and I pointed out that that's not why we were there. And uh, I thought, I just don't want anything more to do with this individual, so I left. And I never saw him again, thank goodness. <laughs> so so that's that's it, really. So did he very much seem kind of in charge of their side of things? No. Uh, no, he he turned up, as far as I know, un, uninvited and um, mumbled up something about demonic possession, which doesn't interest me at all. And um, my colleague, Maurice Gross, was there, and he was in charge of the investigation, so I decided uh, I, I thought I'd leave it to him. And... Um, uh, if you've spoken to Tom Ruffles, he, he was able to get a hold of the um, notes that Maurice Gross made at the time. And um, ha have you already seen those? Yes. Yeah, well, I I read the article several times, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that sums it up pretty well. I mean, I don't think there's anything. I mean, Tom Ruffles is a very, very well-organized um fellow concerning media matters. That's his job. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I can't add anything to that except that um, I had no direct contact at all. I did I did get a letter from Gerald Brittle uh, from Switzerland, I think it was, and um, I sent one of those sort of totally non-committal answers. You know, Thank you for your interest, sort of thing. <laughs> and that that's it. And this was the letter that was uh, also sent to the publisher of, 
of your book about the time it was being published? Is that the one you're referring to? Um, no, the, the, the Warrens were there in, in the summer, I think in about June or so of 78, when the case was just about over. I mean, it was winding down. And um, the book didn't come out until a year later. So, so um, I hadn't started writing it until the end of '78, mm-hmm. because I was um, I was moving house at the same time to add, add to the front, and um, it was all rather chaotic. But um, no, no, they didn't, they didn't contribute anything at all, as far as I know. And, and also, um, I don't recall the Hodgson family making any comment on them. Mm-hmm which is unusual because they were pretty good at making comments about everybody. Yeah. And if they didn't like somebody, they said so. And I, I just don't think he made any impression at all on them. I mean, he was one more character who turned up and wandered around and said his piece and went away. And uh, he, he don't think he went there more than once or possibly twice mm-hmm. um, because I, I never saw him again. And, um, that, 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 that's that's really all I can say about uh, Ace Investigator Warren. I I, I, I don't um, no, I haven't seen anything that he published about Enfield. I think he may have, but I haven't seen it. Yeah, I wondered if you know uh, uh, they have a couple of books that talk about quote their case files, and I wondered if anyone knew of actual case files existing from their couple of of visits. Well, I mean, they may have written all sorts of stuff, but I can't read everything, and I've got right. worthwhile books to read, and I have no time to <laughs> waste on rubbish. And and, and if um, if Warren had said anything worth reading, I think somebody would have told me by now, and they mm-hmm. haven't. So, according to Tom Ruffles, you know, there was a a letter sent to the publisher of your book, and it seems almost like there was some kind of competition uh, because their book. Uh, clearly was a little later after their visits, but it seemed to make all kinds of, of claims that couldn't be supported. Do we know what, I mean, do you get a feel for what his intentions were, I guess, Mr. Brittle at the time? No, I, I really didn't take any notice of him. I mean, I, I just, as I said, sent him a sort of polite goodbye letter, and um, yeah, he came on with all this stuff about... De- demonic possession, so I'm just not into that, and I, mm-hmm. I didn't want to talk about it. I thought it was a complete waste of time, mm-hmm. and, and um, I didn't see any sign of so-called demonic possession ever. In the year, the 14 months that I spent in, uh, in touch with the family, and I think I would have noticed it if they'd been uh, growing horns and breathing fire and turning red and all that, I think I would have noticed it. (laughs) I would think so. You know, if we compare your time and effort on this case compared to theirs, um, (laughs) I want to make sure we give the audience a good idea of the time and commitment that you gave in this case. And I'm curious to know if you ever did the math. Were you mostly coming and going or did you actually, you know, stay overnight at the home? Give us an idea of the effort and the time you put in. Well, I stayed overnight um, about 20 times, yes. And um, I also went and stayed overnight when the family was on holiday just to see if anything was going to mm-hmm. go on when the house was empty. And unfortunately, it, well, I mean, it didn't. Although I would have quite enjoyed it if it had, but it didn't. And um, Moise Gross and I, at the height of the case, one or the other of us, or quite often both, would go there practically every day for about four months. So, I mean, I'd been there well over a hundred times. And the same with Maurice Gross, um, likewise. So, um, I think when you compare that to the Warrens once or possibly twice, absolute maximum of three, there is quite a difference. I mean, that's just, I'm trying to wrap my brain around the level of of commitment that that takes from people who have lives and other research going on. And, and uh, I mean, that's, if anyone has any doubt, you know, what kind of concern you had. And, and to me, that's just, that proves it right there. Well, I never, I never wanted to get involved in the first place. Um, as I explained in the, in the book, um, this, this house is haunted. I was actually hoping to go on a holiday 
mm-hmm. when I heard that we, I went to a lecture at the Society for Psychical Research, which just happened to be on Poltergeist, and I just happened to be sitting right in front of Maurice Gross, and I hardly knew. We just sort of said hello and uh, exchanged that kind of level of greetings. Because he was a new member, and he'd, he'd hardly, um, hardly sort of found his feet there. And uh, at the end of the talk, he jumped up and said that he was investigating a case right now and would appreciate some help. And I said something to the effect of... Um, well, I'm just going away on holiday, and uh, if it's still going when I get back, I'll see what I can do, but um, can't really do, uh, help at the moment. And then on um, three days after that, I heard him on the radio. BBC did, did a live... Uh, no, well, no, it wasn't live. They, they sent a reporter to Enfield who recorded quite, quite a lot of interesting stuff happening at night. She spent the night there and then went straight into the studio to describe her experience uh, with the tape. And so I thought, uh, heavens, this is a case that I can't uh, ignore. So out went the holiday, and um, off I went to Enfield and stuck it out for, i say, 14 months. The chapter on Enfield in Brittle's book consists of 17 pages, but the way I figure only nine of those pages discusses Enfield specifically. Um, Is, is, is that enough to build a movie on? Well, I don't know if Mr. Brittle ever went there at all. Um, I I certainly never saw him. I never heard um, anything about him. Um, As I say, I haven't, I haven't seen anything that I, that either he or Warren wrote so I can't really comment on it, except that I very much doubt if it was true. Mm-hmm. And I also wonder, you know, if we look at the timeline of when the Warrens first got there, which, you know, really is the uh, the end of the time that of the commitment that you guys had been there. But what was the level of activity like around the time of the Warrens? Was the was the activity fading by that point? Can you do you oh, have any idea? Yes, definitely. I mean, the the, um, the case began in sept- um, September of seventy seven, and was very very intense right up to Christmas. We had a good three months of practically all the time, you know, something happening every day, and quite often. Um, almost non-stop. I mean, we did at one point try to keep an accurate record of how many incidents actually happened, and I, I managed to record 11 in the space of one minute. So I thought, well, this is just not going to work. I mean, <laughs> I haven't got time to write them down, and there were about another half dozen when I was trying to write them down, so, so we dropped that <laughs> plan and just decided to keep tape for recorders running as much as we could and um, I still have more than a hundred cassettes 90 minutes each which are pretty well full and wow. um, the, these, they're, they're all carefully preserved in the SBR's archive and um, will eventually have to be transferred into something more permanent which will take some time but it, it probably will, will gradually be done mm-hmm. But after um, after the new year, seventy eight, it, it did quieten down slightly, but it kept kept going, and didn't didn't come to a com- complete end until October. So it was a very long running case, and unusually long. Mm-hmm. So I I do I did read in Brittle's book they do give the SPR, the Society for Psychical Research, credit for previously investigating, although they don't give specific names credits but they say that the previous investigation was handled you know with a fine tooth comb is what they say um they conveniently leave out the fact that your investigation was so exhaustive and lasted over a year but they did manage to you know kind of insult you and they mentioned that uh, you abandoned the family without educating them on how they could get rid of the activity. And they even say, quote, it seems no one even knew what was happening. How do you, how do you respond to that? 
Well, it's complete nonsense. I, I, I I'm really don't know what he's talking about. And there, there wasn't another investigation other than ours. Ours was the only one. And, and um, as, as for educating the family, we were at it all the time, and we gave him a very detailed account of exactly what poltergeist was supposed to be and uh, what, what you can do about them and um, everything I, I knew about them I, I passed on. I, mean, I think that's complete rubbish for us. But I really can't waste time with these people. I mean, there have been several of them. We, we've had a lot of rubbish written in various papers all over the place and uh, life is not long enough to answer them all. And also, they, they don't really <laughs> deserve answers. But, um, I'm always very happy to have a sensible debate with Somebody like, like yourself who is asking reasonable questions and wants to get to the facts. But uh, unfortunately, too many people have got their own uh, prearranged agenda and they, they've made their minds up before they get involved with the facts. So, so you, you can't talk to them. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a waste of time. I, I really don't have any, any, any time for these people. I mean, I've had various brief encounters with people like. James, Randy, and so on, and um, I, I really can't take them very seriously, so I just, I just sort of go away. You know? mm-hmm. So, so let's spend a bit of time on the BBC miniseries, The Enfield Haunting. In in two two thousand fifteen, BBC yeah. produced this. It was supposedly based on your book, correct? Uh, well, I had a long discussion with my agent about what "based on" actually means. Mm-hmm. Because it apparently, and according to her, it doesn't mean what I thought it meant. Mm. I mean, I thought it meant something uh, implying some kind of similarity between the book and the film. And she said, "No, it's a, it's um, what it amounts to is that they buy they the filmmakers buy the rights to the title, which um, they did, and uh, very correctly paid for very promptly." And once they've bought the rights, they can do what they like. Mm. And I've got no control at all. The only way I would have control is if I produced the whole series, which would have cost me um, several times more than I'd actually possess. So that was that was um, out of the question. And um, I just had to take the attitude that um, television invariably gets everything wrong and, and, and sure enough they did but they sold a lot of books which is that's, that's <laughs> what I hope and so I'm not complaining yeah it was a tremendous surge in book sales and and the book is true and nobody's, nobody can mess around with it so, so there it is and that, that's people who want to know what really happened who got about a book I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> and luckily a great many of them did so, so um, that was very nice well, I wasn't sure what you thought about that, and I was hoping that you know you had some amazing things to say about it. I thought the movie was was really great, but I I did notice you know quite a few differences that I planned on asking you about. So that's that's interesting to hear. Well, sure, certainly, what differences? Yeah, do you want? To, would you like to hit on some of them? Well, they. Um... I I, um, I met the actor uh, Matthew McFadden who who played me. He was a very very charming fellow, and I've already seen him in a couple of excellent films. He he was um, in Pride and Prejudice and and Anna Karenina, both times with um, Cara Knightley, who, who he managed to walk off with in both pictures. So I was quite impressed by that. And um, he was very professional. He wanted he wanted to know what ghost hunters look like and I told him we looked like anybody else and uh, we, I had a, I gave him a few kind of suggestions about how to, how to react to what was going on not very much and same with Tim, Timothy Spall who played Maurice Gross and was remarkably like him and they say I mean I really felt that I was talking to Maurice when, when <laughs> I agree I agree when, you know, when, when Timothy came around he'd already seen a few uh, video clips and he's really, he's one of our best actors. I mean, he's absolutely superb and very nice fellow and very, very, very serious and um, determined to get things right. And I thought he he was quite superb, deserved some kind of prize for that. And so were the, um, the two girls uh, mm-hmm. um, were, were pretty good. I mean, the, um, the one who played uh, 
the, the older sister was, was very physically very similar and the one who played Janet was a bit prettier. I mean, she was really quite a, quite a little um, Lolita, but, but um, the, original, the original wasn't quite the same uh, <laughs> degree, but perhaps luckily. But um, yeah, the, the, the acting and the direction were very classy indeed, and the uh, set was reasonably accurate. Mm. And Morris's uh, red Jaguar was absolutely accurate. That's the most <laughs> authentic thing in the whole series. Wow. Uh, the, they got the car right, and uh, I think it was about one year earlier, but it was near enough. And he did have a wonderful Jaguar, which I have pleasant memories of traveling at exactly twice the legal speed limit in <laughs> uh, 140 miles an hour, which was quite fun. So, um, yeah, that was authentic, but nothing, none of the incidents shown actually happened, except the first one. Mm. I forget what it was, but all the others were completely invented, and uh, I certainly never levitated to the ceiling. But more seriously, they left out all the really good ones that did happen. I mean, for instance, when um, Janice insisted that she'd gone through the wall into the house next door, and... We went into the house next door, which was shut at the time. There was nobody there. And later, when we could get in, um, the owner of the house discovered a book belonging to Janet in her bedroom. And it's just not possible to, to, for that to have got there by any kind of normal means. The window was shut. There was nobody in the house. The door was locked. Well, that's one thing. And, and then um, Janet was seen uh, through the window from the street by the school crossing uh, lady who, what we call lollipop ladies, you know, they, they see the children across the road when they come out of school, and she saw Janet floating up and down, like something out of the film of The Exorcist, you know, that, that was exactly what she was doing. She was, she was up in the air, going around in a circle with all kinds of slippers and boxes and things also flying around in the air, and that was described most meticulously detailed by, by the um, the crossing lady who who is um, in fact uh, virtually a, a police officer. She's attached to the police force. And the other another incident was when the local baker was walking along the pavement and he suddenly saw this um, large red cushion appear on the roof of the house right in front of his eyes. And he, uh, it was like sort of one frame to the next. You know, one <laughs> minute it was, one second it was not there, and what the next second it was. And he still hasn't got over that after all these years. He's still alive, just, he's very ancient, but he won't talk about it because it terrified him, absolutely. Totally freaked him out. Well, there it was, and, and uh, I wasn't there at that moment, but I was there when we tried to get it down, and that was not easy. I had to lean out of the window quite a long way and sort of pull it back over the parapet, which was really quite dangerous because um, I could have fallen out of the window. <laughs> and how, how you how you get it onto the roof with, with a quite a heavy overhanging parapet, you have to lean out of the window quite a long way um, on the edge of a busy uh, street with people walking along all the time who would have noticed if a little girl had been trying to put a cushion on the roof, somebody would have said, what, what on earth do you think you were doing? But they didn't. And um, there it was. I mean, I'll testify to that in court. That really happened. And um, it's, it's been more or less ignored ever since because there is a curious phenomenon that when something really weird happens, people go into a sort of defense mode and they, they, they either pretend that they never saw it or they pretend that it can't have happened because it's impossible. And I go, I've heard a lot of that, and, and it, it's a it's very sad um, fact. It's been going on ever since the 18th century. We had examples of that with the um, early days of the mesmerists in France, where they were, they were bringing about incredible cures just by suggestion. And the medical establishment reaction was um, rubbish. You know, there's no such thing as animal magnetism, so these people are just pretending to be cured. They actually said that in, in print. And um, that's the sort of attitude, and it's still around today. Well, 
I, I do. Um, I can tell you that in, in conversations that I've had from some guests who are, are mediums from the UK and, and, and I would consider friends now and, and I've never been to the UK, but it's uh, coming from them. They seem to say that the UK is way more skeptical and, and way more hard on the, uh, paranormal reports and and things like that. Do you would you say that was fairly accurate? Uh, well, we got both. I think we we have both extremes. We we, we have quite a lot of um, new age nutters, as I call them, who, who mm-hmm. believe in anything strange. Mm-hmm. And we certainly have. Um, I think our skeptics are a lot of better quality than some. I mean, um, I know one or two of them quite well, and and. Um, quite happy to debate with them, which I have done frequently. And we all have a beer together afterwards and get on very well. Um, they're not all as bad as uh, some of the extreme cases. I think they're probably worse in, in the USA for some reason. Than certainly more of them. And um, I've never had any trouble with them, really, because uh, the serious ones, I think the one I know best is... Um, Chris French, who is a professor of psychology in Goldsmiths University here in London. And I've several times had public debates with him. And, and he, he puts his case extremely well, and I respect that. And he he's a member of the SPR, and he's studied the case. He knows it very well, and he, he asks intelligent questions, and he doesn't sort of um, say anything rude. And, and we... We get on fine, and there's, there's no, no problem at all. The BBC portrays you, especially in the beginning of their miniseries, as being incredibly skeptic and, and stubborn, almost. Would that have been accurate? No. Almost nothing in that film was accurate, as far as it was, apart from the actual setting. Certainly, the, the suggestion that I went there to keep an eye on Maurice Gross was absolute rubbish. I mean, we, we would totally uh, cooperative with each other right from the start. We mm. never had the slightest difference of opinion. And it was true that I'd had plenty of experience already with poltergeists, and he hadn't. And I, he knew that, and I, I, I told him about some of my cases that I'd studied in Brazil, which um, I'd already uh, written about. Mm-hmm. In my first book, The Flying Cow. And um, Morris was um, quite well informed. He, he'd read a great deal of, um, about, about poltergeists and uh, psychic phenomena in general from the library of the SBR. He, he was very well informed, and he had a very keen intent, intelligence. He knew how to assess evidence, and uh, he certainly wasn't credulous. I mean, he, he had a scientific training, mm-hmm. and he worked as a professional inventor. He, he invented some very ingenious gadgets, um, such as an automatic uh, newspaper dispenser, which I think was the world's first, where you stick, put a coin in the slot and the machine, actually. Wow, interesting. You don't have to open the, I mean, the, the ones you have in the States, I think you put the coin in and then you open the box mm-hmm. and take the paper by hand and uh, if you feel like it, you can clear out the whole lot. But <laughs> the, the, the one that Morris invented uh, actually dispensed a single paper. Hmm. It was quite ingenious. And um, he did he did quite nicely out of that. It was it was sold, I think, in quite a few countries around the world and he invented some, some toys as well for the children. And um, ran his own business for quite a long time, so many years. And uh, he was a thoroughly respect, respected member of his community. He was a warden of his local synagogue. And um, when I went to his funeral, it was a colossal crowd. I mean, he was really quite a local local character. There must have been 200 people there. It was mm. amazing. And um, he became a great friend of mine. And um, we got on very well right till the end. And we, we stayed in touch with each other right up to his his death. Um, so um, never, never any conflict between us whatsoever. Not even a suggestion of it. So the BBC got that quite wrong, no, no doubt, deliberately, because it makes for better drama. 
Mm-hmm. Now, I, w- I once, the, the very first time I ever did work uh, as a consultant for a TV program, which was back in the 70s, I went to a rehearsal and they showed me some scene, which was absolutely hopeless. And I said, no, that's not what happens at all. That's completely wrong. And the, the director, who was a young lady, who I should think of about 19 or 20, you know, had all the experience of, of a well-informed teenager. <laughs> I mean, like, not very much. And she said, oh, well, we're, we're all interested in whether it looks good. So I thought, well, you've said it all. You know, and that <laughs> My opinion of television hasn't really changed since. You know, They don't mm-hmm. care if it's true or not. They, it's it's got to look good. They do the same with the news. They fake everything. I mean, it, it, it's, um, it's, it's the most dreadful technology there is, as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. And if I had the power to disinvent something, that would be first. The series had a scene where you and Mr. Gross were disinvited and, and you were replaced by someone new trying to help the family. And that scene made me so sad. So uh, I can only assume, and I'm hoping that that was also false. Well, I have no idea what you're talking about. We, we, <laughs> we, weren't, we weren't disinvited by anybody. Yeah, well, that's we, good. Uh, we were told by the local welfare psychiatrist um, said that the trouble would stop if we went away. And um, since he was more or less an official, we had to obey him. Mm-hmm. Well, we didn't, didn't have to, but we decided to prove that he was wrong, and we did go away for a week or so, and, and everything got worse. And we were begged to come back by the family, so we did, and um, nobody else took over while we were away. That's complete nonsense. Nobody else did any investigation up there except us. I mean, we we, we had a number of colleagues who, who who dropped in from time to time. Some of them were very helpful indeed, and uh, including Professor Hasted from London University, who gave us a lot of very useful scientific advice about about um, particularly about the, um, the PK, you know, the movement of objects and um, levitations and that sort of thing. So we we had. We had plenty of help. We had a total of about 30 people altogether who witnessed something in the house. But no, nobody else ever took over the investigation. No, that's absolute nonsense. It just, just, just didn't happen. So I can assume also that Janet was never given shock treatment? I mean, what, <laughs> what else is he kind of going to come up with? I mean, yeah. I don't think you're allowed to do shock treatment in Britain. Yeah. Since since the uh, death of Egas Moniz in um, you know he, somebody gave him shock treatment which which, which killed him uh, um, eventually and um, I'm pretty sure it's, it's it's illegal now. Yeah, I was flabbergasted when I saw that. I was like, what? Well, if anybody had tried that on an 11 year old girl, I think they would have been jailed. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just totally stupid. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's too ridiculous to comment on, really. I'm only <laughs> commenting because you asked me. But all I will say is it did not happen. <laughs> I can assure you it did not happen. You've already mentioned, you know, your colleague Morris Gross and in your relationship, and you've answered a lot of my questions there, and that and that's awesome. Um, I'm curious, and, and you'll have to forgive me, but my audience and just kind of my passions and, and the nerdy things that we like to discuss on this podcast, I'm very curious to know if you feel like you've had any spirit contact from Morris since his death in 2006. Um, no, no, I'm afraid not. Um, not direct. But I think this whole business of um, contact with the dead is, is very much misunderstood. I think mm-hmm. it does happen, but it happens in a very subconscious kind of way. It's mm-hmm. not um, not quite so simple as it is in uh, fiction and films. Mm-hmm. Um, I certainly believe that there is a continuity of consciousness which you see most clearly expressed in cases of um, so-called reincarnation which is a rather misleading word because it implies this complete return of an entire human being, which is not what you get. And what you get is fragments of their memories. And it's rather as if when you when you die, um, the body is disposed of and your consciousness just sort of floats around and now, now and then other people tap into it. And it seems to have a, um, 
an attraction for, for certain people who pick up quite a lot of it. And um, if you look at the vast amount of literature, there are more than 2,000 cases that have been recorded, and at least 500 of them have been very thoroughly investigated initially by Ian Stevenson and uh, now by Jim Tucker, who's carrying on his work at the University of uh, Virginia. Um, the evidence is, is very, very impressive indeed. And um, when I was in Brazil, we, we had um, we put together, I think, about 75 cases altogether, just from Brazil, which nobody had ever heard of. And um, nobody would have heard of them if we hadn't gone out to look for them, follow them up and newspaper reports and that sort of thing. One, one or two of them turned out to be really quite quite extraordinary. Mm-hmm. So that, that's true. I mean, I, I, I can vouch for that. It does happen. But um, I think somehow the, the word reincarnation is misleading because it does imply the complete rebirth of, of an individual, which is not what happens. There, there are exceptions, as in everything else. I mean, we have... One of the best cases ever is right here in England, the case of Jenny Cockell, who who wrote a uh, fascinating uh, book about her memories of a previous life in in Ireland, where she'd never been. And she actually managed to locate the family she claimed to have been the mother of. And they all met up with with the uh, sons, who were now old men, and and they recognized her. They, They... compare all sorts of incidents of, from their life, and they, they ended up totally convinced, and they said so. So that, that was really pretty impressive, and um, there have been other, other equally impressive cases, including um, one, or, one or two from the United States, which, which Jim Tucker has, has studied, and there's one remarkable one which has become quite a bestseller, you know, the case of James Leininger. Um, remembered being a, a pilot in the Second World War. And oh yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a that's a very impressive case, and that was there was some video film made of Jim Tucker interviewing him when he was only sort of five or six years old. So there is there is um, a certain amount of supporting evidence on on record, and um, again we only hear about these things because. Uh, Jim is very conscientious about following these things up, and he he, he does. And, and um, he, he, since he took over from Stevenson, he, he's recorded some very interesting cases. And um, I hope he carries on. On these topics, I'm no expert, and I've I've always said that for sure. And uh, I'm embarrassed to say that it's only been recently that I've been you know looking into your work and. And, and reading your book. And I'm impressed with how balanced you seem to be. I mean, you talked about the, you know, the new age stuff going on, yet the overly skeptical and the work of the SPR. And you seem to be very in the middle, which I think is refreshing. Well, I started out as a, as a journalist. And, and you know, were you, um, if you're working for a newspaper, you, you go to the scene and just, just describe what you see. I mean, you don't have any sort of particular moral judgments about whose fault it was that there was a car crash or whatever. You just described who did what and when. And I, I took the same, exactly the same attitude to um, investigating poltergeists as, as, as I would with a hydroelectric dam or, or, or um, <laughs> plane crash or whatever. I mean, it, it's, it's just mm-hmm. uh, developing the skill to, to describe clearly what you, what you saw. And if you get it wrong, somebody's going to tell you what it wrong because there will be somebody who was there who saw what really happened, and they'll certainly let you know if you got it wrong. Mm-hmm. And um, so far, I think I've generally got things right. So, so I think the the thing about this whole thing that people insist on calling paranormal, which is a word I try to avoid, mm. is that it co- it's it's just a rubbish. It's just a grab bag for anything that people don't understand. And that, that's totally stupid because there are, there are phenomena that people didn't understand once which were considered to be so-called paranormal, like continental drift or, or the meteorites falling out of the sky. They're obviously impossible. 
mm-hmm. they were dismissed out of hand, and and the poor fellow who who, who discovered continental drift, Alfred Wegener, I think he first announced it in about 1912, and it wasn't proved for about another 40 years, by which time the poor fellow was dead, and so so he, he was rubbish out of, out of the, off the stage when in his lifetime, and he was right. He was absolutely right, and 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 um, same with the question of meteorites falling out of the sky. They do, if you, if you uh, stand in in the, at the, on the South Pole long enough, you might get one hit on the head. That seems to be where they mostly fall at the poles because of the uh, the weak of gravity. Mm-hmm. And um, well, it's the same with with everything else. I mean, some. Some strange phenomena do turn out to be true, and others don't. But to to kind of lump them all together, anything that can't be explained scientifically can't exist, which is very much the attitude that we still have. I've frequently heard that direct. I mean, in questions and talks that I've given, I've, I've talked about poltergeists. And somebody has said that that can't have happened because it's impossible. And so I say, well, I'm sorry it's impossible, but it did happen. And uh, I came across a wonderful quote from uh, William Crookes, who was the first scientist in England of any distinction. He, he was the president of the Royal Society. He was the top man, in fact. He was, he, was, he was the most respectable scientist in the country, and he did all kinds of uh, work in, in um, psychical phenomena with medium Daniel Hume. And he says in one of his articles, I never said it was possible. I'm saying it's true. <laughs> and I've taken that as a kind of motto ever since. I mean, I, I don't claim the poltergeist are clearly impossible, but they are true. Uh, I've certainly seen quite enough of them. And there's, 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 they're, they're, as far as I'm concerned, they're as real as anything else. That's beautiful. Were you ever contacted by producers of the upcoming The Conjuring 2? No. I think if I had been, I would have told them to uh, find better your, material to re, uh, <laughs> use. <laughs> fill in your favorite expletive. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I'm just not interested. I mean, unless they offer large sums of money, which is nice. Uh, and um, writing about these things is not a, not a well-paid business. Whatever people think, you occasionally get bestsellers, but very often you don't. And my book was, in fact, not a, not a bestseller at all. It's selling better now mm. than it did when it was first published, which is very unusual. But uh, luckily it is. It's do- doing very well right now, and um, just when I need it. <laughs> I'm not earning as much as I used to but in other ways. So um, it's a funny old world in that respect, but uh, it's far from being my most successful book. I think it comes in at about number five. Wow. I've had far more successful ones, and my most successful book of all didn't didn't say anything to, anything about any kind of psychic phenomena at all. It was all about uh, cosmic forces, sunspots, and things, which was t- totally straight science. Hmm. That, that was a huge bestseller in about ten languages. I mean, that, that uh, far but far more successful than the poltergeist. So if I if I, my approach was entirely commercial, I'd stick to that. Um, you know, I'd go on writing about sunspots all my life, and uh, they, they seem to go down very well. And there's a lot to say about them. They're very interesting and they're quite mysterious and, and in- interesting. But I think I've, I've said all I have to say about them, and it's moved on to something else. I don't want to lead you to any answer on this, but I would find it hard to believe that any conjuring to about the Enfield haunting could uh, not be uh, in promotional things or in the movie, but I I find it hard to believe that it would not be based on your work in some way or another with even the images and, and audio. Uh, I, it just, <laughs> I just can't see that happening. Well, uh, Maurice Gross's son is a lawyer with the, one of the largest firms in Europe so they'd better watch it. They'd better be careful. Mm-hmm. If, if he thinks they've done anything they shouldn't, he will um, send them a note. Will you see the movie when it comes out? I hope not. 
<laughs> no, I'm really, I'm really not interested in this sort of thing. I mean, I, I'm I'm still working on things that I am interested in at the moment. I'm researching uh, identical twins and telepathy between them, which is fascinating and uh, far less controversial because nobody can deny that there are such things as twins, and nobody can deny that they they do pick up messages from each other at a distance. Um, that is absolutely undeniable, and, I, and it's surprisingly almost nobody has ever looked into it properly. It, it, it's sort of taboo. You know, we we just can't have this. It's got to be a normal explanation. And, and uh, I've, I've heard the most amazing nonsense from from so-called experts, even people who are paid to study twins. They say, oh, well, they're genetically identical, so obviously they think in the same way and they say the same things. Well, really, I mean, that doesn't follow at all. It's it's totally faulty reasoning. And also, quite a lot of identical twins never have any experience of telepathy at all. I I should think about half or uh, or so from what I've gathered, but some of them do. And some of them have it very strongly indeed, and um, it even amounts to feelings. You know, one of them has a car crash, and the other one suddenly wakes up at night with a, with a blinding pain in the head, and mm. it feels as if he'd been hit. And uh, there are numerous cases like that. I've got, I've got a whole file of them, mm-hmm. and people contact me um, roughly. I have to think about it once a week. I get an email from Twin who's read some article or my, or my book on twin telepathy. They're giving their own story, and, and they, they fall into categories uh, very easily, and, and um, it is very, very common. Uh, when you think of how many, there are a lot of twins. I mean, about one in, uh, I think the figure for, for Europe is about one in 85 births are twins. And um, I certainly see them all over the place in, in my part of London, and um, quite tempted to stop the uh, mother and ask if I can borrow them for an experiment, <laughs> but it might not last very long if I did that. But, um, it, it is a pity. Um, well, luckily, I've got to know um, at least one parent very well, and I, I have a sort of permanent monitor with with a pair of boys who are now in their teens, who I've actually known since they were born, or about three or four days old. And they've had just one after another. I mean, they, they, they are the most extraordinary um, pair. And we've had them on television twice doing live experiments, which they did very well in. So um, you, you just have to find the right subjects. But some of them, some of them certainly do display telepathy and now, now of course you can actually record it happening with a polygraph mm. where, where you wire one of them up to the uh, machine and you put the other one in, in a soundproof room and then do something uh, sort of give them electric shock or banging on the head or something give, give him some kind of stimulus and the other one picks it up and um, you try getting any of the experts to believe that they just, they just won't have it I mean, it's, it's really quite extraordinary when they see something happening on paper and um, reports from, from people who are present, and the reaction is, oh, yes, well, it was just a coincidence. Oh, you, you just cannot get these people to change their, their minds once they've been made up. Mm-hmm. It's like trying to melt concrete, you, know, you just can't do it. Well, I, I'm glad you went into all that because I was going to ask you about it. And uh, it seems like you stay, you're staying busy. Are you enjoying life? Um, yes. Well, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying uh, such uh, activities I'm able to do. I'm uh, not running around as much as I used to, but I, I'm, I'm still fairly active. I'm certainly very interested in, in the twin work, which I can do, luckily, most of it on email. Mm-hmm. And um, I've written several articles all over the world and, ask twins to send in their own accounts, which they do. And um, hopefully one day there will be another book, although it will be very much more of the same. As, um, it's, it's always the same old stuff that they come up with. 
you know, we have had a quite a breakthrough where the largest twin unit in the world, which is right here in London, they've got 12,000 of them on their books. They've given permission to a colleague of mine to do research there as a visiting scientist, which means that they, they don't give them any money, but they give them their facilities, and that, that's a tremendous help. And um, we've already done um, large-scale survey. They, they have a get-together every year. They have a garden party, which is a kind of combination of business and pleasure. Because they've got a very beautiful garden on the river, right across the river from the House of Commons. And they have this big party every year where about two or three hundred of them pairs turn up. And we took this opportunity back in 2009 to, to question the whole lot of them, about, about 220. Simply asked them, have you ever had experience with telepathy? And about half of them said yes. An enormous number. And nobody had any idea that so many... Uh, twins did have experience of it. It was just brushed off because nobody had taken the trouble to ask them. I mean, isn't it rather obvious if you want to find out something, go and ask them. <laughs> but that, that, that doesn't occur to a certain type of scientists. They decide that it can't happen. There's no point in asking. It's, it's impossible. End of story. Well, luckily I found a professor of psychology who is now in Sweden, Adrian Parker, English an English uh, psychologist who's professor at the University of Gothenburg. He, he he's extremely interested and he's he knows how to do proper experiments and he, he's already written um, two articles in a scientific journal about the work that we've done at King's. And it's becoming respectable. It's now um a paper in a scientific journal that others can reference. And that, that's how you that's how you get into the science racket. You know that there has to be a there has to be a precedent that you can mention, so that you are not making it up yourself. Uh, the, the, the tricky part is getting in first, which we have managed to do luckily. And um, I've also done four TV programs, um, all in favour of making use of television when it's in my own interest, which which it. It certainly was on this occasion because we showed it happening live. We had a pair of twins wired up to a polygraph and then gave one of them um, uh, a shock. The favorite one for children where you have to be very careful is just to have a bucket of ice-cold water and ask them to plunge their arm into it, which is actually quite good for them. It gets the circulation going. And it gives them a, a very considerable shock, and very often the um, brain waves of the other twin pick them up. So that's the, that's the easiest way to test it. Anybody could do that in half an hour in any lab anywhere in the world, and they don't. And, um, well, I've done it, I think, about 20 times, and it's worked almost every time. And um, it's very simple, doesn't cost anything. A few ice cubes. If you, if you have the polygraph is expensive because you need a, if you need a professional operator that's very expensive but if you actually happen to have one they're not terribly hard to operate and um, you can see the the signal actually being picked up on, on the graph and I reproduced one of them in, in the book and they, they I don't know what to say I mean I, I Knowing thing, the way things go, and in about 50 years' time, somebody else will discover the same thing and claim that they knew about it all along. <laughs> that, that's literally what does happen. And I'll be, be long deceased by then. And then somebody will remember, oh, wasn't that weird fellow uh, Playfair? Didn't he, he discover that back in the 21st century? And um, they'll dig up a yellowing copy of my book and they say, oh, <laughs> gosh, so he did. Incredible. Why didn't we hear about this before? <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid I don't have a lot of respect for <laughs> science as a, as a sort of monitor of progress in human knowledge. It's, it's, it's far more up to people like me, you know, these sort of crazy pop writers. After all, it was Arthur Kersler, popular writer, who financed the most successful research program has ever been in parapsychology at the University of Edinburgh, which is still going. 
It's the only one left in, in um, well, there are none left in the United States. No, no university faculties in parapsychology. There's, I think, two in Europe, apart from Edinburgh. And um, it was entirely financed by a popular writer. So um, then again, the most one of the most successful experiments has ever been in telepathy was um, done by the writer Upton Sinclair back in the 1930s, who wrote a book called Mental Radio, which apart from the title, which is misleading, it was a brilliant book and it's full of, um, it's still frequently quoted today as an example of how to get it right, uh, how to actually do telepathy, thanks to his remarkable wife, um, Mary Craig, who, who was the subject and um, Sinclair, of course, was no kind of scientist. He was a popular writer. And um, so I think we, we, we're ahead of the field in this, in this business and uh, hope they'll just catch up with us one day. Well, I look forward to, um, I have a lot of homework to do now and a lot of things to catch up on. So I thank you for filling us in on uh, some of your, you know, your current stuff. Is there anything... Um, you'd like to uh, direct my listeners to find more information about you or anything else you want to mention before I hang up? Um, you find a certain amount on the internet. I think if, if you um, if you go you go to the publishers uh, White Crow Books, they they have a kind of um, biography and also quite a lot of uh, things that I've written and I, I've written. Um, Quite a lot of articles on the skeptical, what's it called, um, skeptical about skepticism, mm. which is a site which is dedicated to debunking the skeptics, which is great fun. <laughs> I, I do quite a lot of that, and um, that's um, available on the internet. And um, there is also, um, uh, ooh, well, I think that'll do. That'll do to start with. It's quite a lot of stuff out there, but the um, publishers got all my details of all my books and things with four of them are still left in print, which is very nice. And um, the, the telepathy one and um, the Enfield case and also um, my book about hypnosis called If This Be Magic and one about Brazil, which I called The Flying Cow. So they're still, still available. And um, I hope, uh, I hope I hope people enjoy them. I can't tell you again how honored I am that you let me talk to you. And if I was uh, limber enough and wouldn't have a trip to the hospital, I would probably do a cartwheel as soon as we hang up from this conversation. So, <laughs> well, you're welcome. I hope your listeners uh, um, don't get too scared by by poltergeists. That's- they're not likely to come. They're not contagious. They won't. They won't catch it themselves. <laughs> um, so I think they'll recover. <laughs> well, good luck with your show, and um, thank you for calling. Have a great weekend. And you. Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye. You're listening to the Big Seance Podcast with Patrick Keller. Look for us on iTunes, and be sure to check out BigSeance.com for more discussion. Oh my God, how awesome was that? And I loved to hear how passionate he was about the twin research. Tell me what you think. Shoot me an email. Continue the conversation in the Big Seance Parlor on Facebook. If you're not a member, just request to join, and I'll let you in. We'd love to have you. And as always, just check out BigSeance.com for show notes and some of the links that we mentioned in this episode. I want to sincerely thank Mr. Playfair for talking to me. I really did feel like doing that cartwheel. And thank you to Dr. Tom Ruffles for your research and for connecting us. Having this podcast is so cool. We'll see if this rabbit hole keeps going or if it leads us to a new one. Peace out, Paranerds. 
For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit BigSeance.com, now the home of both the blog and the podcast. Just click on the Big Seance Podcast logo or find it in the menu. You can also find and subscribe to the show on iTunes and Stitcher. Do you have any comments or feedback? Please contact me at Patrick at BigSeance.com. You can call my feedback line at 7755-TELL-ME. That's 775 775- 583-5563. You can also record audio feedback right from the site using the SpeakPipe link included in the show notes. I could decide to include your voice in a future show. Thank you so much for listening and reading. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out. But we'll see you and light them again next time.